was, it was a three page piece. Um, and I've gotten more responses from that one three page piece than I've anything in my life. I got death threats from it. I've got emails. I got not emails. In those days, they were, they were sending letters, um, commentaries that you know you compared American philosophy to the Ku Klux Klan, and philosophers are above the issues of race and ethnicity and gender discrimination. <laughs> they engage in abstractions. They're not engaged in discrimination. Um, and by comparing philosophers to people who, to, by, by saying that the American Philosophical Association or any of these philosophers were, was an organization which was essentially designed by the Ku Klux Klan um, because it discriminated against people of color, um, what you've done is to degrade the profession um, and thereby degraded me. So people were not very happy with that piece. Um, I tried to deny it, it didn't work. Um, but that one piece, got me more trouble than anything I, I have ever written. I've written a lot. Um, um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's sort of the history of that piece, believe it or not. And this continues to happen. A young man, a young man named George Yancey wrote um, a, a piece in the New York Times, uh, for which I don't particularly agree. But I don't see his, his thesis was, his, his, was that, uh, among other things, you know, he said, I'm a male. And so because I'm a male, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sexist, so I need to work on that, you know. Um, if you're in a world which anti-black racism and you're white, you need to work on the fact that, you know, there's anti-black racism and, and, and you have privileges, and so you need to work on that. So I said, well, that's kind of nice, okay, yeah. But then he gets thousands of responses threatening his life. Doing philosophy sometimes can be a very dangerous project. <coughs> it's not always easy to do this. Because sometimes you have opinions that other people disagree with. And so you engage in dialogue, hopefully respectfully, across lines of discourse by presenting arguments about fundamental assumptions about the nature of things. But sometimes um, that can get you in a lot of trouble because you are addressing people's foundational beliefs about something. Um, and that crosses all kinds of lines of race, and ethnicity, and gender, and class. Um, because that touches the foundation, so to speak. Um, but I do philosophy by a struggle, which means that I don't do philosophy in a Socratic fashion. In other words, I'm not just interested in dialogue on the assumption that by engaging in dialogue and looking for fallacies and inappropriate forms of reasoning, I will reach a some burnham, a place of supreme in, in knowledge. I will have the truth, and then I can enlighten you by virtue of having uh, reached this point of, 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 of knowledge. Um, a sort of Socratic methodology. I don't do Socratic methodology. I do um, a, a conception of philosophy that I take out of Frederick Douglass, which is a philosophy born of struggle, which means that I want to look at the kinds of issues that the people who are least well off look at. Those who have been despised and degraded, those who have been self-deprecated, what questions are they asking? And it's from that population that I find the most philosophically interesting question. It isn't that I think they're going to have all the right answers, it's that I think they raise the kinds of questions which are the most interesting, and not the Socratic questions about the nature of reality and the nature of form. Um, so I come from a different sort of conception, or I'm trying, I'm trying to develop a different conception of what it is to do philosophy. Uh, so in that process, one of the theories that I've been recently been working on, and worked on for some, some time actually, is um, the ethics of insurrection. And they asked me to talk about that today. Um, I've not talked about it before. I've written about it and published it in there as a journal, uh, Transactions of the Charles Sanders Peirce Society. That's a special edition on the concept of the ethics of insurrection. Um, and so people have written about it um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit, um, um, of what, what, what it means. Um, um, and so part of what I'm going to try and do today is to defend the thesis of the ethics of insurrection uh, and try and clarify at least one or two claims about it. Um, what's the main thesis? Um, the, the main thesis is, 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 is yeah, as well as several features of the main thesis, is that um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, an ethics of insurrection requires you to um, reject instrumentalism and consequentialism and um, to promote a different set of, of virtues of self-reliance. Um, pragmatists believe, among other things, 
that it's important to engage in what's called the methods of intelligence, to, 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 to reason out things, to get answers, to look at um, uh, co uh, 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 confirmation and uh, uh, verification of evidence, um, and then try and find a solution. Uh, so you use instrumental reason to do that. Um, and it's, Dewey is, is a classical pragmatist and he thinks of instrumental terms. You know, how does this work? And what kinds of experiences can I draw upon to find an appropriate answer? They're fallibilists, all, all right. They're not saying you can have all perfect answers. But they think it's very important to look at human experiences and to verify evidence in order to make a claim. Uh, pragmatists are also consequentialists. That is, part of what they think is that it's important to look at the results. If you are in favor of a, a particular policy, what are people's experiences with trying to make that policy real? And what are the results of it? You know, not just speculation, but what are the consequences? If you're going to participate in nonviolent civil disobedience, what are the results of that? Um, if you're going to look at education, what are the results of that edif edification? What are the kinds of consequences that you want to see? So they want to look at and then revise your practice to fit your goals. So there's constant dialogue between means and ends. There's not one means and one end, but there's constant dialogue between back and forth. Pragmatists are engaged in verification and dialogue and discourse. They see truth as something we as much create as we find in the world. <coughs> we have to work on it. You know, um, um, sort of a Jamesian picture of a stream of consciousness. Truth is not already there. It's something that um, we um, work on to make it the case. Instead of looking for metaphysical absolutes in the world, let's look on ways in which we can make things better for ourselves. Instead of looking for um, um, uh, abstractions and living through <coughs> arid notions, let's see how we can live through one another. So that's the pragmatist approach. They're instrumentalists in some sense. Mm. Um, well. Um, um, the first thesis of, of the essence of insurrection says, look, um, and that doesn't work. Uh, uh, there's something wrong with the consequentialist picture. Um, my main group of people that I rely upon is David Walker, Lydia Childs, Maria Stewart, Henry David Thoreau. So I start the piece off by saying, look, um, what is slavery like to somebody? What is it to be in a condition of servitude? Um, the, the ship, um, the barque in the car, that's a 700 ton ship, uh, there's a uh, uh, philosopher named Michel Foucault used an example of a, um, a, a panopticon, um, which was first developed by Jeremy Bentham. Uh, a panopticon is a, 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 a prison. And the idea of a prison is that you're enclosed in a prison. And um, um, in that prison, in that building of a prison, you are being watched by someone. But you don't know when they're watching you. But you always feel that you are being watched because it's a closed building, it's a circle. And the watcher is in the middle of the building. And the watcher can see everyone around him. And everyone around him can see the, what they think is the watcher, but you don't know whether or not they're in the tower watching you. Consequently, you watch yourself. You police yourself. You imprison yourself. You make yourself the prisoner. Because you're watching yourself, watching someone watch you. And so you watch yourself more because you're afraid of <coughs> violating any of the rules set by the prison. So the prison guard does not have to watch you. You'll do it for him. That's the idea of a slave. You don't have to watch the slave. The slave will go to the back door without you telling it. Because they've been 
adapted to that formation. So um, I thought about Foucault's use of the panopticon. I said, well, here's another way of thinking about servitude. A slave ship, one way in which they built slave ships was to have um, the ship include what's called a bedicado. A bedicado is a barrier in the middle of the ship. On the right side, um, the, the uh, sailors could stand. And in the barrier in the middle of the ship, on the other side, there would be the slaves. And they can lift up the bedicado, they lift up the, the, the gate. Um, and um, if you want food, you have to talk to the sailors to get it. If you want water, you have to talk to the sailors to get it. If you want to defecate, you've got to talk to the sailors to do it. All of your life-sustaining features are dependent upon the people who are keeping you into servitude. The barrier allows something very important. If there's a slave revolt, if the slaves uh, decide to revolt to try and get off the ship or to try and attack the sailors, they close down the bedicado, the gate in the middle. On the right side, then they can stand and shoot anyone on the other side of the fence. And it doesn't matter whether you are among the revolting slaves or not. Innocent or guilty, involved or not, you become a target of the people who you depended upon for your very survival. A minute ago, you were beholden to them for your water and now they're shooting at you. If you're on this side of the Bedicado, you're engaged in a parasitic behavior. You're going to start attacking other slaves. That is, you begin to destroy yourself. This is not unusual for slave societies. And one way to think about this is that we look at, we look at oh, Socrates was living a really great time, man, Aristotle and cool, man, they were already doing great stuff, man, they were like, you know, 90% of Athens were just slaves, right? they were house slaves, servants, you know, just, just servants, right? You know, 30% of the population were just slaves, just, you know, just, just servants. How do you have that kind of population? You know, they have to be attuned, working on your behalf without supervision. One way it's done is they've been terrorized. The slaves on this side have been terrorized. They're in a parasitic relationship. Now, I look at slavery in that way as a condition of parasitism, a condition in which you are faced with no options. To behave appropriately means you're guilty. You're liable to be harmed. To behave inappropriately, you're liable to be harmed. You are faced with harm through unintentional actions on your own part. So, in the argument for insurrectionist ethics, one question I asked is, what would justify an insurrection? If I use pragmatist reason, I could never justify a slave insurrection. Slave insurrections are almost always failures. David Walker, in his appeal to color citizens of the world, um, promoted slave insurrections. Maria Stewart uh, stood before the house, and um, the woman said, her third sentence said, you know, um, uh, why sit ye here and die? Mm -hmm. She had lost her family, her husband was dead, she lost her business because they didn't allow her to be a woman in control of her own business. Her children were gone. She was a barnstone abolitionist. Abolitionists believe that you ought to end slavery immediately, as opposed to a gradualist who believe that you should gradually end slavery. Um, so she was in favor of terminating immediately. But she was also in favor of a different set of attitudes towards slavery, to revolt. David Walker had been um, uh, uh, associated with slave insurrections most of his adult life. He knew full well that they were failures. is isn't that they don't contribute to the ending of servitude, it's just that he couldn't win. Slave insurrections rarely, if ever, 
in the institution of slavery. 